Moon. Welcome to a special takeover edition of the Inner Loop Radio. I'm Rachel Louise Snyder. I'm here with my trusty puppy, Iliad, who you may hear barking or wrangling in the background. We will be your hosts today, although only one of us is human. And I'm here to talk about inspiration and possibly a little bit of perspiration. So I've written four books. I am a professor at American University, professor of creative writing and literature. And for the first three books that I published, which probably took 20 years because I'm kind of a slow writer, I really believed in discipline and um, I did not subscribe to the fact that writing could be cathartic at all. In fact, I really pushed away those ideas. Like I was very much like, no, you must be, you must be disciplined and you must be at your desk from 10 to noon every day with no distractions. And I remember sometimes in the early days getting mad when friends would call me during those hours or whatever, like as if I had to answer the phone. And that, that did actually sort of work for me for the first three books. But then I got really sick and then COVID hit. I lost both my parents, my stepmom and my dad. I had lost my mother many, many years before as a kid, which I'll talk about in a second. But it was like a whole a whole bunch of things just sort of conspired. And I really lost all that discipline. I lost that motivation. I lost everything. And yet somehow in that time period, I wrote a memoir. And that memoir came out in May. It's called Women We Buried, Women We Burned. And there's not a lot of like, when I think about how did I write this? Like, how did this get done during COVID? Like, (laughs) it sounds terrible, but I'm not sure that I have the answer. I just remember not being disciplined about it, writing in sort of fits and starts. Um, And I do have a writing group, even though I've been a professional writer for 30 years. uh, There is a writing group. There are five of us in it. We are all professional writers. We are you know, all pretty well-known people. And yet even we need sometimes the accountability of friends. So I have found that group to be um, just really foundational in my writing life for the last couple of years. And I think they would all say the same thing. So somehow I got through this memoir and I found much to my chagrin that writing it was in fact cathartic. And I didn't like I totally didn't want to admit that, like even when I was on book tour, I remember thinking people are going to ask me about this is sort of the classic question of memoirists like, oh, did you expel your demons? Like, (laughs) not really. I still have my demons. I mean, you know, my demons make me the cynical but humorous person that I am. But there she is, Iliad. She's epic. But I did find that there was something cathartic about the writing of this, of that book. And that there's something cathartic about a lot of my writing these days. Maybe it's my age. I don't really know. Um, but I do have one little trick that is super weird. Probably weird. Maybe only I think it's weird. But when my grandmother died around 99, 2000, somewhere in there, it was left to my brother and I to clean her house. She lived in Boston on the North Shore. And she had a pretty big house, actually, and it had been her mother's house before that. So we had a lot of stuff on our metaphoric plate to do. And one of the things I found was this massive, massive book right next to her reading chair. She had a reading chair in her bedroom. She was a pretty avid reader. And I have the book in front of me today. It's actually the second deluxe edition of the Webster's New Universal Unabridged Dictionary. It is 2,347 pages. It's 320,000 definitions. Of course, Google gives me access to way more than 320,000 words. But I loved this book because, first of all, when my grandmother was reading something and she came across a word she didn't know, she wrote it out on a piece of paper and she would put it in this dictionary. So when I first summed through this dictionary, it was like, Seeing her handwriting, it was like finding a little secret note from her, from the great beyond. I remember one of the words she had looked up was palimpsest. So great. And every time I've used that word, which is probably not very often, and no, I can't find where and in what 
or article or whatever I I used it. But every time I use that word, I think of her. So when I do get stuck, I read the dictionary. Um, more specifically, I read the Webster's New Universal Unabridged Dictionary that is 320,000 definitions. I don't know what it is about learning new words that kind of ignites my imagination. I think it's like I instantly think of how that word could be used as a character trait or in a setting or as a, you know, point of conflict in a story. Like it just instantly fires my neurons in my brain. And for whatever reason, it really works for me. So give it a try. See if it works for you. Now I'm going to just read a little pretty tiny bit of my memoir because I feel like I've been writing this memoir in some way for 25 years. I first wrote it probably about 94, 95, like when I was in grad school. And the first half was really lifted straight out of my life. And the second half was fictionalized. And I remember my agent, I had just gotten my agent at the time. And I remember her saying to me like, you know, the first half of this novel is really solid, but the second half, (laughs) I was like, okay, just wait another 25 years. And I, I rewrote this book, like, you know, tip to tail. Is that what they say? Top to tail? I don't know. (laughs) Front to back at least four times, like threw away the manuscript and rewrote it, not just revised it. And it came out in May of 2023. So, you know, books take as long as they take. Um, And so this to me connects to this beautiful dictionary that I have, which also connects me to all the women that came before me that have enabled me to be in this moment talking to you. This is the beginning of the book and I'm coming home. And this is the day that my, my mother, this is the last day of my mother's life. That the ambulance was parked on this day was new. Usually they had their lights going, sirens off, engine running, strapping my mother on a thin gurney. But today it was like they'd stopped in for coffee, popped in to see how Gail was doing. Her split-level brick house, a regular stop on their route, like the mail. I wore white jeans with the name Benedict Arnold in bubbly orange letters all over them. Casual Friday. My mother only let me wear pants to school one day a week, and never jeans. Benedict Arnold made the cut because the pants were white and orange and thus did not qualify as jeans. Back then, only pants that were blue qualified as jeans, even if they had rivets and five pockets and side seams and were made from actual cotton. I wanted the freedom of movement that boys had in their jeans, the freedom to dive for a base or do a layup into a basket, the freedom to climb a tree. My mom dressed me in Mary Janes and white tights, pleated skirts and blousey tops most days, but once a week... I chose my white and orange Benedict Arnold's. An EMT stood in our blue carpeted living room at the bay window where my mother kept alive spider plants and a Christmas cactus and ferns. The details mattered on this day. The parked ambulance, the immobile EMT, not taking her away. No wheeled stretcher. I remember him looking out the picture window, a tangle of plants waist high. In my memory, he's headless. His radio crackles through the house. People say children are intuitive, that nothing gets past them. I picked up all the tiny cues this day. Parked ambulance, gathering of relatives, men in blue, but missed the primary event. My mother seemed old to me then, 35. It was only the years still to come that brought her youth into sharp focus as I myself aged toward that number. She was old, and then she was young. Many years later, my father claimed she had called out to Jesus in her last moments. But he had been at work that day, and he and his co-workers took off early to go and play flag football. And this was the age before mobile phones, so no one could get hold of him for hours, long after the immobile EMTs turned mobile again and took away her body. He hadn't been there, but I had. Cancer took my mother, but religion would take my life. I invite you to read the rest of the book. I hope it's the best book I've ever written, because of course the writer's hope is that you get better with every book. 
I do think, uh, to get back to my original point, that you do have to be disciplined in some sense. And I also think that you have to be still. You have to allow stillness into your writing practice. I was outside the other day in my backyard grading papers, and I was trying to describe to a student how to listen to the world as as they sat in a new place, trying to create a scene. And it occurred to me that, like, even the sounds I was hearing, right, the metro buses, cars going by, birds, all those sounds had layers. And if you sat and listened, you wouldn't hear just one type of bird. You would hear birds calling to each other with different tones and different, you know, notes. And that this sound was really rich and layered. And it it was just a reminder to me that part of the writing practice, I think, involves stillness and listening and being open to the things that the practice can teach you. So that's it for today's show. You can find me lots of places. I am a professor at American University in the MFA in Creative Writing Program and Journalism. I have a joint appointment over there. I'm also on all the socials at RLS Writes. And my website is rachelouisesnyder.com. The Interloop Radio will be back next Monday with a new episode. Remember to subscribe so you can get inspired, get focused, and get lit. And I would say maybe get a little bit still, too. I'm Rachel Louise Snyder with Iliad, who's destroying my carpet for the Inner Loop Radio. Thank you. Thank you.